The views and opinions expressed on America's Workforce Union podcast and its digital media channels are solely those of the speakers and do not necessarily represent the views and opinions of the producers or sponsors. Welcome to the America's Workforce Radio Podcast, the flagship production of the American Workers Radio and Podcast Network, where organized labor and its never-ending fight to protect the rights of the American worker come first. Now, presented by LIUNA, Laborers International Union of North America, here's your host, Ed Flash Ferens. A new resource to train workers for good manufacturing jobs. And you can thank the AFL-CIO. Today on the show, the Farm Labor's Organizing Committee and the one week that changed the world. Welcome to the Thursday, August 29th edition of America's Workforce, where we're available on at least five platforms, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spotify, and Pandora. We have two guests on the show today. We're going to start things off with a dear friend. Baltimore Velasquez is his name, and he is head of the Farm Labor Organizing Committee. You can check him out online, FLOC.com. This is a social movement and a labor union. They're affiliated with the AFL-CIO, and they represent farm workers across the Midwest and the South. They were actually founded in the mid-1960s, and... Flock has been instrumental in advocating for the rights of migrant farm workers. And this is a very, very significant day. Why? Starting today, August 29th, an agricultural employer will not be able to hire temporary foreign workers unless, unless it guarantees that it has not and will not intimidate, threaten, restrain, coerce, blacklist, discharge any person because such person has engaged in activities related to self-organization, including any effort to form, join, or assist a labor organization. The bottom line, the new rule gives temporary farm workers the right to organize. That is very, very significant. Why? Because only 1% 1% of farm workers are represented by unions, and the National Labor Relations Act, going back to the mid 30s, excluded farm workers from union organizing and collective bargaining protections. And Baltimore is going to talk about that and the new Department of Labor rule. So he'll be our first guest. Then we're going to go to D.W. Gibson. This guy is an author. And he came out with a book a couple of months ago, One Week to Change the World, an oral history of what happened in 1999 at the World Trade Organization in Seattle. This was a movement. Happened in late 1999, where more than 50,000 people converged on Seattle, and their goal was to shut down the World Trade Organization conference. Well, They pretty much succeeded. It was ugly at times. I mean, there was a lot of brutality. Police were called. But uh, it did change the conversation on trade, at least for a while. And this is a really interesting book because it's an oral history. And D.W., who has written a number of uh, labor-related books, talked to about 100 original people, protesters, police, politicians, artists, you name it, union members and got their view of what happened in Seattle. It's quite amazing. One week to change the world in oral history of the 1999 World Trade Organization protest. And now a brief look into the world of labor. This segment brought to you by Boyd Watterson Asset Management. You can find more at boydwatterson.com. Following the Biden-Harris administration's record investments, and I mean record investments in American manufacturing, The AFL-CIO Working for America Institute, better known as WAI, is developing a new resource to help train workers for manufacturing jobs. And they're doing this with a $1 million grant from the Families and Workers Fund. WAI is an innovation of the Labor Federation to bring together unions, employers, and community groups to create the pipeline of skilled workers for high-quality union jobs in the industries of the future. 
This new grant, which was awarded as part of the Families and Workers Fund Powering Climate and Infrastructure Careers Challenge, that's a mouthful, will support WAI's Manufacturing Core Curriculum, MC2, which trains workers for entry-level and advanced manufacturing jobs and connects them to registered apprenticeship programs. Got a comment here from Liz Schuler, who is chair of the Working for America Institute board and, of course, president of the AFL-CIO. She says, we look forward to continuing to ensure that all new jobs created by this administration's landmark investments are good union jobs that empower local workers as well as their communities. By the way, the uh, Family and Workers Fund is a platform for collective action and a pooled $125 plus million dollar collaborative fund supported by 40 diverse funders working together to build a more equitable economy that uplifts everyone. I like that. Time now for another segment of Labor 130. This is a special feature presented by Blue Cross and Blue Shields National Labor Office to promote the upcoming 130th anniversary of Labor Day this coming Monday. Well, today, we take you back to 1981, very, very significant time in labor union history when 12,000 members of PATCO, the Professional Air Traffic Controllers Organization, walked off the job when talks broke down with the FAA. Then President Ronald Reagan said, if you don't go back to work in 48 hours, you're fired. And that's what happened. Joe McCartan is a longtime labor professor at Georgetown University, and he wrote the book Collision Course, Ronald Reagan, the Air Traffic Controllers, and the Strike that Changed America. And boy, did it ever. Well, Flash, it really was a game changer. Forty years ago, um, when the PATCO strikers, as they, their, their union was the Professional Air Traffic Controllers Organization, when they went on strike, and they faced that ultimatum from Ronald Reagan, and they defied him, and then were fired and replaced. That really changed the, the, the direction of labor relations in the United States. Going up into that event, uh, during the entire post-war period uh, after World War II, um, the labor movement had really relied on the strike in key situations to be able to give workers leverage. Um, there was already strong pushback from employers against that in the 1970s. Uh, and, um, you know, workers were finding that employers were, were increasingly uh, tough at the bargaining table. But the strike was still uh, a primary tool for workers when they needed it. Uh, however, when Reagan fired the air traffic controllers and then got away with it, and in fact even got some public support for it, um, that encouraged business leaders in the country to adopt a far harsher line, uh, and in fact even to, to emulate Reagan. Now, Reagan could fire the air traffic controllers because they were federal employees, and there was no right that federal employees had to go on strike, he warned them, return to work in 48 hours or I'll, I'll terminate you. Uh, they defied him and he followed through. But workers in the private sector, at least theoretically, had a right to go on strike and to use their, their power of withholding their labor to get their employers back to the bargaining table. However, lots of employers decided, hey, you know, Reagan replaced the air traffic controllers. Why don't we try to do this if our workers go on strike? And mm -hmm. in fact, many, many did that. Um, and it was when employers really began to use the, the threat of replacement workers to break strikes that, that the union movement was set back on its heels. The number of strikes in the country that, that workers were able to engage in dramatically dropped uh, and workers lost an important part of leverage. And if you look at what happened to inequality in the United States, uh, you really see it beginning to, to grow rampantly uh, at this very moment and after. Once workers started to lose that leverage, uh, that's when massive inequality started to surge. 
By the way, PATCO was decertified as a union, and Reagan was kicked out of his own union. The Screen Actors Guild and union density began its decline. The PATCO strike demonstrated that the federal government would act as a strike breaker, making unions more hesitant to use strikes as a tool. By the way, there had been no federal government intervention on labor unions to shut down a strike since President Grover Cleveland shut down the Pullman strike in 1894. Oddly enough, it was Grover Cleveland who signed the legislation creating the holiday Labor Day. Go figure. This segment is brought to you by Blue Cross and Blue Shield's National Labor Office. Blue Cross and Blue Shield companies formed out of a need to provide affordable health care to teachers, to loggers, and miners. And in 1965, the Blues developed the National Labor Office to strengthen its commitment to organized labor. Today, Blue Cross and Blue Shield's National Labor Office remains focused on America's workers, advocating for affordable and equitable health care, partnering with strategic alliances to provide industry-leading products and services, and proudly serving more than 18 million unionized workers, retirees, as well as their families, all working hard for America's working families and for the health of America. You can learn more by following them at Blue Labor on LinkedIn and X, formerly known as Twitter. All right, we're going to take a quick break. Baltimore Velasquez, the head of the Farm Labor Organizing Committee, is coming up next. This is America's Workforce. It takes Layuna to keep America running. Over 70,000 public employees are part of Layuna, the Laborers International Union of North America, delivering critical services such as health care and emergency response, as well as maintaining roads and sanitation systems. Even the National Postal Mail Handlers Union, representing over 47,000 U.S. postal workers, is affiliated with Layuna. Find out what it takes for Layuna to keep America running at Layuna.org. That's L-I-U-N-A dot org. America's Workforce is brought to you in part by the United Steelworkers. You can find more at USW dot O-R-G. We're the nurses, firefighters, and claims representatives that help keep our government services running. We respond to natural disasters. We care for our nation's veterans. And we investigate discrimination in the workplace. We are federal and D.C. government workers. And we are proud to serve the American people. Working in more than 70 agencies across the government, we know... We can fulfill our mission because our union has our back. Learn more at AFGE.org. Paid for by the American Federation of Government Employees, AFL-CIO. This segment of the show is brought to you by the Brotherhood of Maintenance of Way Employees Division of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters. For more information, please visit bmwe.org. The Alliance for American Manufacturing is a nonprofit, nonpartisan partnership formed back in 2007 by some of America's leading manufacturers and the United Steelworkers. Their mission is simple, strengthen American manufacturing and create new private sector jobs through smart public policies. Key word there is smart smart. We need to be smarter than ever in today's highly competitive world. The Alliance for American Manufacturing believes that an innovative and growing manufacturing base is vital to America's economic and national security, as well as providing good jobs for future generations. Good jobs today, good jobs tomorrow, good American jobs. Find out more at AmericanManufacturing.org. America's Workforce is brought to you in part by the Ironworkers. You can find more at ironworkers.org. America's Workforce is brought to you in part by the International Brotherhood of Teamsters, where you can find more at teamster.org. Now, back to America's Workforce. Here's Ed Flash Ferens. And remember, you can check us out on Facebook or follow us on X, formerly known as Twitter. That would be AWF Union Podcast, AWF Union Podcast. By the way, this next segment brought to you in part by the Ohio Federation of Teachers, oh.aft.org is your website. Let's go to line number one. Welcome our featured guest today. Love talking to this guy. We got to talk to him more because he's a fighter, especially for farm workers. Baldemar Velasquez is his name. And he is the president of the Farm Labor Organizing Committee, which is a social movement and a labor union that represents farm workers across the Midwest and the South. Goes back to 1967 when they were founded. And I'll tell you, today is a very significant day 
because it's going to help a lot of farm workers who want to organize, especially the temporary farm workers. Baltimore, welcome back to America's Workforce. Thanks for joining us today. But before we get into the changes here from the uh, Department of Labor, maybe you can give us a quick assessment. We got a lot of new listeners on the show. We are now the number one labor union podcast in America, and we're in the top 1% of all podcasts. So you got a pretty good audience. We want to grow the Farm Labor Organizing Committee. I was reading earlier that only 1% of farm workers are actually represented by unions. So we got some work to do. Maybe you can give us a little history of the organization and uh, what you've been able to accomplish during that, that during that time. Go ahead, my brother. Well, uh, to begin with, uh, the reason there's so few uh, farm workers unionized because we have no legal mechanisms no legal frameworks to unionize. In 1935, we were excluded from the National Labor Relations Act, so uh, we've been excluded ever since. Actually, the reason we were excluded because the Southern Dixocrats, conditioned to supporting um, Roosevelt's uh, law, the NLRA, uh, is was to exclude farm workers because most of them were black in those days. They didn't want black people to have the same rights as white people. And so we've lived with that racist legacy ever since. So organizing farm workers in the U.S. is very, very difficult. There's only two states in the country that have uh, collective bargaining laws for ag workers, and that's California and now New York just recently. But the conditions of uh, union organizing on the West Coast the middle part of the United States and the East Coast, the the production systems are completely different. For us to unionize workers in the middle part of the United States is very difficult because the farms are suppliers to major manufacturers and retailers. We saw this quite clearly early on. So we pioneered what we call these supply chain agreements. Our first big fight with Campbell Soup it was the, the 2,000 of us that went on strike back in 78, and that strike lasted uh, eight years to 86 and a boycott of seven years where we finally compelled the Campbell Soup Committee to sit down and negotiate not only uh, with us but with uh, the growers who employed us. So we created the, the first, we signed the first supply chain agreement in labor history where we got the manufacturer that contracts uh, our employers uh, to grow tomatoes, cucumbers, and all the other crops. And we concluded that first big smash uh, victory in, in 1986 and have duplicated that same model several times with the Heinz uh, Corporation and their cucumber production in northern Ohio, with Dean Foods and their subsidiaries and Jane and Green Bay Pickles, uh, Green Bay Foods. And then um, in 2004, concluded a supply chain agreement with the Monalo Pickle Company that uh, brokered the largest uh, union victory in North Carolina since the J.P. Stevens boycott and campaign. And now we represent about uh, 9,000 workers on 950 farms in an umbrella agreement throughout the state of North Carolina and Virginia. So that's in a nutshell, that those are the challenges we face uh, to try to create independent mechanisms for union organizing, which is really tough to do. We have no legal way to go about it. We just have to be creative and do what we got to do and um, call on supporters to support our campaigns and like we're doing now with uh, Big Tobacco. We got a big fight going on with Reynolds American, the largest uh, tobacco company in the U.S. Part of our secret is that, uh, not secret, but our Trojan horse concept is always been the main uh, crop that runs through production in the South, tobacco. But those farms are suppliers to major corporations and uh, retailers, and that also grow different. They're very diversified. So if you got the tobacco workers unionized, you automatically have them organized uh, for the other crops that are harvested. Everything from cucumbers to sweet potatoes to Christmas trees, uh, strawberries, and the like. It's a very difficult thing to navigate and create the independent mechanisms and to make these uh, farms uh, recognize unions uh, among the agriculture workers. So essentially, you're trying to organize with your hands tied behind your back. And that's because of what happened back in the 1930s. And they didn't include farm workers in the National Labor Relations Act. Let me ask you this, Baltimore. Now, I know you mentioned California and New York. What about uh, lawmakers in Congress today? 
those Dixiecrats, well, I guess some of them are still around. <laughs> what do you think about it? But I'm just wondering here, have you tried to change that part in the National Labor Relations Act or, or is it not getting anywhere on it? Well, the problem is that it's mixed in with the immigration debate. And uh, you're, we're not going to get anything out of, the, out of the Congress in the next future. Even if you have uh, the majority of Democrats in both houses, they're very lukewarm to the idea. Because, number one, a lot of these migrant workers don't vote. They're undocumented or they come with work visas now that is growing tremendously. Uh, about a third of all of the temporary work visas in agriculture is called the H-2A visa are using that program for um, agricultural workers throughout the country. And so, you know, they're not going to be able to vote. And so it's not a priority to uh, lawmakers. So let me ask you this. Since we're not getting anywhere on the federal level, you are we going to do this state by state? I mean, there's still a lot of farmland out there, and there's some, you know, pro-worker governors out there. Outside of New York, you got New York and California down. Any other states you're targeting right now? Well, again, one of the problems is the it's very hard to craft laws that uh, for unusual temporary work uh, situations like the crops that grow. Some are short as four week harvest, others are much longer. And there's a big distinction between uh, production on the sale on the West Coast and the middle part of the U.S. Uh, on the West Coast, you're particularly talking about larger corporate farms. In the Midwest, you're talking about small uh, mom-pop family farms that are suppliers to you know, major food companies and uh, retailers, including like Walmarts and Costco's, and then manufacturers you know, like uh, Reynolds Tobacco and the major food store chains like uh, you know, you know, Kroger's or different people that these, these suppliers sell to. And so how do you craft a law to take these things into consideration? And uh, New York is, is experiencing that right now. You're trying to unionize these small farms that got a cap at their on their income. So what are you going to negotiate benefits for when a grower that supplies his uh, milk to some dairy uh, cooperative uh, and only gets a certain price for it? And that's what he's got to work with for benefits to his workers. There's a ceiling that you hit that makes it unprofitable for the supplier to uh, give his workers uh, to make it uh, economically feasible to give workers like a pension or uh, vacation days and things like that uh, when he's got a limited uh, margin uh, himself. So these supply chain agreements are not taken into consideration in these laws that you include, including reforms, you know, departmental regulations that pits uh, the small family farmers against farm workers and vice versa. And that's a lose-lose situation. I gave you one example in the H-2A program that's overseen by the Department of Labor. They raise the prevailing uh, wage every year not to undercut domestic workers, which is a ridiculous argument because in our part of the country, there's no domestic workers that work in agriculture anymore. You can't find them. So that's why they're turning to this guest worker program from Mexico. Uh, and these farmers that are suppliers to major corporations, when you increase the prevailing wage every year based on uh, wage receipts from the previous year, the prevailing rate goes up. It's, it's been going up about a dollar every year to a major corporate farm. They can absorb that, but these small family farms cannot. At some point, it's going to hit that uh, level where uh, it doesn't make any sense for them to you know, keep putting more and more on the input costs, whether it's the workers that do the harvesting, all the fertilizers, transplants, and everything, and hoeing, weeding, everything they put in uh, from the price they get from Kroger or, or uh, Reynolds Tobacco or some uh, other uh, retailer. It doesn't make any sense to them to grow that crop anymore. And so they, they go out of business or downsize and we lose our jobs. Again, that's it's a lose-lose situation. We need to figure out a way to connect the people at the top of the food production system, that's the corporations and the retailers, to uh, create a sustainable pricing model for commodities so that the, uh, the farmer can make a living and also pay his workers a fair day's pay for a fair day of work. Yeah, that's what we want. We're speaking with Baltimore Velasquez, president of the Farm Labor Organizing Committee. Do check them out online. FLOC.com is their website. There is some good news. There's a new Department of Labor rule that starts today 
which will allow temporary farm workers the right to organize. We'll talk about that next, right here on America's Workforce. You're listening to America's Workforce with Ed Flash Ferrans. It takes Lyuna to power North America with affordable energy. The men and women of LIUNA, the Laborers International Union of North America, have the skills needed to build and maintain oil, natural gas, nuclear, solar, and wind projects that are shaping America's energy future. From new energy tech to retrofitted facilities, LIUNA members do it all. Find out what it takes to be powered by LIUNA at LIUNA.org. That's L-I-U-N-A dot org. America's Workforce is brought to you in part by the Communication Workers of America. You can find more at cwa-union.org. There is unity and strength for workers. We are the USW. We are the USW. The The United United Steel Steel Workers. Workers. The largest industrial union in North America. We represent 850,000 members in In the the U.S., US, Canada, Canada, and and the the Caribbean. Caribbean. We work in metals, rubber, chemicals, paper, oil refining, atomic energy, and the service sector. We are steel workers, standing strong and fighting for what's right. America's Workforce is brought to you in part by the International Federation of Professional and Technical Engineers. You can find more at ifpte.org. The Iron Workers Great Lakes District Council, consisting of eight iron worker local unions in West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Michigan. We build the skylights and bridges along the Great Lakes. With more work than ever before, the Great Lakes District Council is actively searching out the next great iron worker. Whether it's building the next Intel plant or constructing a bridge to safely connect our great cities along the lake. So join the Iron Workers Great Lakes District Council today. Find out how and learn more about the council by visiting IWDistrictCouncil.com. America's Workforce is sponsored in part by Boyd Watterson Asset Management, LLC. Find out more about our investment solutions tailored to meet the needs of Taft-Hartley funds at BoydWatterson.com. Now, back to Ed Flash Ferrans with America's Workforce. And remember, you can check us out on at least five platforms. That includes Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spotify, and Pandora. And when you get an opportunity, here's what you do. Just sign up and receive our shows on a regular basis and give us a rating. We always appreciate those five-star ratings, so please keep them coming. By the way, this next segment brought to you in part by the United Labor Agency. ULAgency.org is our website. Let's go back to our live line and rejoin our featured guest today, Baltimore Velasquez who is the president of the Farm Labor Organizing Committee, FLOC.com is a website. Been around since 1967. Baltimore, president for about 46 years now. He's seen a lot. He's done a lot. And as I indicated, the farm workers have their hands tied behind their back because they were excluded from the National Labor Relations Act 90 years ago. And a couple of states have uh, moved forward. We talked about that in the first segment with New York and California. We just need more states to do the same, but it's it's very difficult. There is some good news to share, though. Starting today, August 29th, and this is courtesy of the Department of Labor. We've got a friendly labor department. And starting today, an agricultural employer will not be able to hire temporary foreign workers unless it guarantees that, quote, It has not and will not intimidate, threaten, restrain, coerce, blacklist, discharge, or in any manner discriminate against any person because such person has engaged in activities related to self-organization, including any effort to form, join, or assist a labor organization, or has engaged in other concertive activities for the purpose of mutual aid or protection relating to wages or working conditions. Boil that down. The new rule gives temporary farm workers the right to organize. Baltimore, this was a long time coming. I don't know if uh, your organization or how much of a role you played in this, but uh, we know how uh, temporary workers have been exploited. I I got a number here. I'm looking at about 370,000 workers, temporary farm workers, who will be protected. You have to be pretty happy about this change here. Maybe you can give us a little uh, insight into it. Go ahead. Well, I think it's a limited step forward. And let me just provide some more background information on it. I think it's an extremely 
helpful rule. It'll help us organize from retaliation on the spot, but then we have to expect retaliation anyway. And the only thing that it it allows us to do is uh, file for um, deferred action, uh, which means that the worker can get the social security number and a work permit for two years. Uh, that is renewable, kind of like the DACA students that were brought here without papers as as uh, as young people when they cross the border without papers. And so and it has to be renewed every two years. So there's a limit to it. But the uh, concerted activity is important to protect that step. But that's all it does. You can sign up 100 percent of our workers on a on a farm, but it doesn't compel the employer to recognize the union and negotiate a collective bargaining agreement. Mm-hmm. That's why I'm saying we have no legal framework to accomplish that. So that means that the organizers who are doing it have to come up with a plan. And I think the only way that you're going to get the supplier to a major manufacturer or retailer to recognize a union, if the retailer or the um, the big food company can compel their suppliers to recognize uh, some framework uh, and, and something to hold them accountable like we have. We establish an independent commission that we engage at every uh, time we uh, get a uh, manufacturer to agree to recognize the union and um, put them under the auspices and oversight of an independent commission that functions like a labor board by private agreement. So Flock has its own National Labor Relations Board, known as the Dunlop Commission, which we founded back in 1986 when we brokered the that agreement with the uh, Campbell Soup Company. And every manufacturer we take it on since then, we get them to recognize that commission because it allows them to have the authority to issue fines, penalties, and make whole remedies uh, for violations of the rules for um, of representation and collective bargaining. Uh, so your organizer has to do all of that kind of stuff to create some kind of framework to hold it together and get manufacturing retailers to recognize that because the suppliers of the farms that are our employers, if, they're, if their buyer or their crop tells them you got to do this, that's what they're going to do. Uh, and so that's the challenge of organizing. This is a step that's very helpful so because it allows us to protect workers from immediate retaliation so that we can keep on doing the broader organizing and create those independent frameworks. I like what you said, since you were excluded from the National Labor Relations Act, which started the National Labor Relations Board. Since you were excluded, you started your own National Labor Relations Board. I, well, you, you got to do what you got to do. I, I get it. Yeah. I know the Department of Labor, sadly, they have very limited resources when it comes to investigating employers. So that's kind of your job now. You got to help them out on that. But and to your point too, I guess, and this goes across the board, Baltimore, you know how difficult it is to organize across all industries. Yeah. And the fact is when employers violate the law, I mean, they get basically a slap on the wrist. Let's be honest. It's across the board. And sadly, we just we need better labor law in this country. That's the bottom line on the whole thing here. But at least you're moving it right direction here with the Department of Labor. We just you know, I guess you got to take those baby steps before something really, really good happens here. So as far as the Farm Labor Organizing Committee, I just like to speculate. I mean, you've been you've been doing this all your life. You're dedicated, you're passionate. And those of you listening, if you go to the uh, website, FLOC.com, there's a lot of stories about people that got injured on the job. They lost an arm. They lost a a finger and uh, they couldn't work anymore. And as a result, they joined the Farm Labor Organizing Committee because they they needed to get to an organization that would help other people so it wouldn't happen to them. As far as the future, you know, there's a big political divide in the country here and it's been going on for a long time. I got to hand it to you. I mean, you are a fighter from day one. How do you see the future here, Baltimore? I mean, it it has not been easy. I'm hoping it's going to get a little bit better. What do you think? Well, we accept things as they are, not that we like them, but we have to start from where we are, and we don't have legal frameworks for collective bargaining. Well, heck with it. We create our own. Right. And so the whatever the political climate is, uh, I mean, we brokered that Campbell Soup agreement during Reagan's administration. He was very anti-union, you know, air controllers uh, union breakup that he did. Uh, it was in the middle of that that we fought the Campbell Soup Company. 
And so in the worst of times, you know, we have to rise to the occasion and do what we got to do to protect people, especially the most vulnerable uh, workers that we have. And I grew up that way. And I'm telling you, when I was little, I said, when I grow up and I'm old enough to do something about this, this is what I'm going to do. So it's a career that chose me. I didn't choose it. I wanted to be an engineer. But in that step, I, <laughs> I, I, know, I knew how to crunch numbers. <laughs> My math skills are pretty good, which would allow me to analyze the the supply chain prices and understand where all the uh, things were coming from to help the workers. And uh, you got to know your math when it comes to all of this stuff, when it comes to bargaining. And so um, we got to do what we got to do. We don't know what the, the future is going to throw uh, at us. It's kind of like, uh, I don't know if you saw that movie, The Gladiator, but there was a scene where he's in the, the arena and uh, and he got the other gladiators around him and said, look, we don't know what's going to come out of those cages, but it's better if whatever comes out of them, it's better if we stick together. Yeah. Yeah. That's what uh, collective action is all about. Yeah, that was a good movie. That was a good movie. Too bad he died in the end there, but uh, it was very uplifting in a, in a number of parts. <laughs> all right, my friend. Thank you for, for citing Hollywood, because sometimes Hollywood definitely mimics reality of what's going on. There's no doubt about that. So you take care. You keep up the fight. Stay in touch with us. You know, you got an open forum here on America's Workforce. This show is your shows. OK, brother? I uh, appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Baltimore Velasquez, president of the Farm Labor Organizing Committee. Do check them out online, FLOC.com. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, the one week that changed the world. That story coming up next on America's Workforce. This is America's Workforce. This portion of the show is brought to you by Anthem Blue Cross and Blue Shield, labor's trusted health partner, bringing people, communities, and care together to transform the future of health. For more information, please visit anthem.com slash labor and trust. Attention members of the Heat and Frost Insulators Union who are interested in traveling. Central Ohio has more construction projects on the books than anywhere in the U.S. Mega projects, large and medium-sized jobs are creating more work than our local 50 brothers and sisters can handle. Projects like Intel, the Honda LG battery plant, and multiple data centers for Facebook, Google, and Amazon offer union wages, overtime, and exciting incentives. Local 50 is seeking union travelers to meet the needs of its signatory contractors who can put you to work immediately. If you're a member in good standing and interested in the work opportunities in Central Ohio, visit insulators50.com forward slash AWF travel for more information. This portion of the show brought to you by the International Union of Bricklayers and Allied Craft Workers. For more information, please visit BACWeb.org. The Heat and Frost Insulators and Allied Workers are proud to be a title sponsor for America's Workforce Radio. The Insulators Union is leading the way in the mechanical insulation industry, fire stopping, and infectious disease control. Regarded as North America's energy conservation specialist, these professionals are known for their professional work and dedication. You can learn more about the Insulators Union at insulators.org. This is America's Workforce. More shows available at awfradio.com. And remember, you can check us out on Facebook or follow us on X, formerly known as Twitter. That would be AWF Union Podcast. By the way, this next segment brought to you in part by the Ohio Federation of Teachers, oh.aft.org. Well, before we go to our guests, I just want to take you back in a time. I started doing this show, America's Workforce. In 1998, and uh, not too long after that, there was a huge protest in the city of Seattle. I remember they called it the Battle in Seattle. And uh, when 50,000 people converge on a city, well, I guess you know it's going to become a news event. And joining us on our live line right now is D.W. Gibson, who recently came out with a book, One Week to Change the World and Oral History of the 1999 World Trade Organization protests. D.W., and that's how you want me to refer you? It's D.W. Gibson, is that right? That's it. It's a pleasure to be here, man. Okay, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, that was one heck of a protest, and uh, to your point, uh, it did change the world, maybe not to the extent that some had wanted, but uh, 
why don't you uh, tell us a little bit as to uh, well were you around at that time i know this is an oral history it's kind of it's kind of interesting how you laid this out because it's not a typical type of book like chapter one chapter two this is an oral history of people who more or less some were there some were not there but it's how they how this event affected them but uh, now did you cover the battle in seattle let's start right there I did not. No, I was in college at the time. And, you know, I, I think I've been motivated to do this project by a few decades of curiosity about it. I remember it as this major event that captured headlines all around the country and seemed to be consequential in the time. But it really has been largely forgotten in the last 25 years. And it's hard to imagine that we're coming upon the 25 year anniversary of these protests. But so I think it's sort of that that nature of being forgotten was what drove me to do this, and also just for the nature and the size of the, the, the protest, everyone that it drew to Seattle to come together, the big tent coalition that came there. And I think the thing that makes it so singular is that you have a protest, you have organizing that goes around an event, the WTO ministerial meeting in Seattle, and the protesters have a goal that they set in advance. They want to shut down the meetings, and they want to prevent the WTO from reaching a new, more expansive agreement. And the protesters reached that goal. They blocked all the intersections leading to the convention center in Seattle nonviolently through civil disobedience, 50,000 people, union members, environmentalists, Catholic priests, anarchists, people from all walks of life. And they met the goal of shutting down the WTO meeting on the first day. And over the course of the week, slowed down progression so that they could not reach that agreement. They didn't even leave town with a joint press conference. And so I wonder, you know, how many examples can you point to in the last 50 years of protesting in the U.S. where protesters set a goal and they met that goal on this scale? It's pretty remarkable. Yeah, very remarkable. So what I did was I set out to... I set out to interview, you know, about over 100 people who were there since I wasn't there. And for me, it's sort of like, you know, I'm the shepherd taking everyone who wasn't there for that experience into these conversations so that we can better understand what actually happened. So, D.W., connecting with these 100 interviews, that had to be uh, interesting in itself. Uh, how did you track them down? And uh, did they did they come to the table offering, yeah, this happened here, this happened there? Talk to me about that part. You know, it, it, it's a it's a it's a lot of work to find everyone, and a lot of times people lead to more people, and so you've gained someone's trust, and then maybe perhaps you're able to gain another person's trust through that person. So there was a lot of that going on. Um, some people right away were really eager to tell the story. Some people were very much not eager to tell the story, and took many months of sort of going back and forth and and convincing them of my intentions, which were really quite straightforward. I wanted to tell the story as comprehensively as possible from a sort of helicopter perspective. So all of the action is there, right? And that means not just talking to people who are involved in the organizing, but also all the layers of law enforcement too, Seattle PD and sheriff and state trooper and secret service and FBI, because President Clinton was involved, right? So many heads of state involved. Talking to city officials, the ex-governor, right? All these perspectives of the story can be as complete as possible. And I think I got a lot of buy-in to that. Uh, and people understood sort of the importance of that because it hasn't ever really been done. And especially for such a significant event that, again, you know, we talk about Occupy, we talk about other movements that have happened, but somehow Seattle, which is where we first see the people's microphone call and response, right? It's where we first see the Internet as an organizing tool, right? All of these sort of elements is where we first see militarization of police departments in the modern context that we see now everywhere. So it's a really a, a point of origin for so many important things um, that I think it really deserves to be brought to the forefront again. D.W., let me ask you this, your, your format in the book, and this is an oral history, it's interesting to go that route. In fact, I don't think I've seen this done anywhere else in a lot of the authors that I talked to. What was the reasoning for that? I have to ask you. Yeah, I mean, I think it traces back to the fact that I wasn't there, right? And, and I'm, I'm coming as sort of, again, sort of bringing my curiosity to the page, right? Bringing my, converse, my, my curiosity to all these conversations. And I think that if we're really going to understand what happened that week and how all the organizing happened and how all the action from Monday to Friday happened and all the aftermath, I think it really has to come from the people who were there, who were on the ground. And I wanted the, I want the book to be immersive. I want people to feel like they're put in the middle of those months of organizing, that they're put in the chaos of the street during that week of the actual protest. I want it to be 
sort of really a wraparound experience that way. And I wanted everyone to come together. You know, as you point out, the, the, the book is sort of one voice passing off a moment to another, right? You might hear someone for a sentence or two or a few paragraphs, and then another voice comes in. And what it is, is it really is like a chorus, right? A chorus that sort of sings the story to the reader. And I wanted to allow everyone to do that. I wanted to facilitate that process. That was my goal. And I really like this form. I think hearing from people who are at historic events, hearing their firsthand accounts is one of the best ways that we can understand how those events actually go down, especially something as monumental like this, where you had so many cohorts, again, coming from so many different uh, entry points of, of the things that were mattered to them, right? Reasons why they were pushing back on globalization and WTO. And of course, no cohort bigger than all of the union involvement. It was just massive, massive union involvement. Yeah. Oh, it got a whole lot of media attention and it wasn't good media attention. I mean, they, they showed it, there were some ugly parts of the battle in Seattle and that's why they called it at that. But I have to ask you this, the, the 50,000 number, when you talk to these people, did they think it was going to become that big? I mean, 50,000 people in any city is a lot of, I mean, there's some cities that don't even have a population of 50,000. Yeah. But I'm just wondering what, what was their take on that? Yeah, that was about 10% of Seattle's uh, population at the time, a, a massive gathering. Um, no, no one really knew it was going to be that big. You know, it's, it, police said that their initial estimates were around 5,000 people they were preparing for. And there was this thing that happened over the course of the summer as all the organizers were doing all their work and some of that was was becoming public. You know, police kept upping their estimate. Oh, we think it's going to be 10,000. Oh, we think it's going to be 15,000. And one of the best lines from one of the organizers, a guy named Han Sean, he put it best. He said, you know, we, we kept giving estimates, you know, saying, oh, we think it's going to be 30. Oh, we think it's going to be 40,000 people. And he said, you know, we were just Babe Ruth's pointing at the fences, you know, and do, you know, making our best estimate, hoping that that would happen. We had no idea how many people would show up. Uh -huh. um, and, and there were, you know, a lot of it. So it was really a lot of guesswork. But 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 in fact, everyone did show up. And there's this key moment where, you know, this blockade, the, the nonviolent blockade is going on downtown. Uh, uh, people have been there for hours. They're getting tear gas. They're wearing thin. They need more bodies in the street. And there's this great moment where uh, a self-described hippie sort of says he looks up at the hill, up on Capitol Hill, uh, where he sees uh, just thousands and thousands of teamsters and yellow rains, yellow rain slickers coming up, the, coming down the hill. And you know, he said to himself, "Here comes the cavalry, reinforcements." Right. Yeah. So that, that sense. Of, 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 of needing more and more people throughout the first day that was critical throughout the week. Um, that number played a big part in making this happen. DW, one of the people you talked to, and I got to give a shout out to him because I know he's listening to the show, Mike Dolan. Mike Dolan from the Coalition for a Prosperous America, retired team. So yeah. we just had him on the show not too long ago. And uh, there's a lot of Mike Dolan in this book. And uh, the Teamsters, he was a Teamster for a long time. They were very, very prominent in that because they saw jobs disappearing. And you think about 1999. Okay, NAFTA goes into effect in 93. And then what was it, 2000, 2001, we normalized relations with China. We saw a lot of jobs disappear. And so many in labor said, you know what, we can't, we can't continue with these crazy trade deals. You know, they talk about free trade, but it's not fair trade. That's the problem. And then mm -hmm. on top of it, and I saw this in some of the notes, Y2K was right around the corner. Everybody's thinking, oh, my God, the world is going to end. Yeah. So we better we better do something about it. So let me ask you this. Yeah. Changing the world, the whole idea, it was one week to change the world. Now, you stopped him for that week, but it really didn't change. Talk to me about that part, because, you know, these corporations, they came back with a vengeance. We know what happened, D.W. Absolutely. Absolutely. And to that first point you made, too, I mean, unions were so important because, you know, we're a few years past NAFTA at this point. Right. People can see the. it's not even writing on the wall. People know what's happening with globalization. Right. And when trade agreements try to tell countries uh, how they can shape their labor laws and how they can shape their environmental laws. Right. It, it's really about pushing back. Not just not just pushing back on globalization, but but getting out onto the streets on, on behalf of democracy. Right. We want to have a voice in these processes. And, yeah, you're right. I mean, this was a massive success in the short term. Again, they set a goal and they met the goal. And that is so rare. Even for that reason alone, I think that this should be under this week should be understood in its totality. But, yes, in the 25 years since, it, it, you know, it's a little strange because 
on the one hand, the WTO has remained pretty weakened. They haven't reached so many of the agreements that they were hoping to reach 25 years ago. Um, the U.S. has sort of whisked, uh, pulled back on its involvement and support of the organization. But that hasn't stopped corporate governance, right? That hasn't stopped corporate power from shaping uh, how Americans work and live their lives. And I think we're still at this point where democracy needs to step up to bat and handle some of the malfunctions we've seen in globalized capitalism to protect workers and to protect the economy that we live in. DW, your publicist said this uh, book serves as a practical handbook for protesters. And I'm thinking about that time and where we are today with social media. Social media was pretty much non-existent 25 years ago. And I'm thinking if done right, yeah. wow, you know, if, if there's enough passion out there, we could probably beat that 50,000 number depending on, on the circumstances and, and depending on what we're protesting about, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I think the, the way that the book is, is really sort of a handbook, sort of instructional, if you will, and it's inspirational and structural on, on organizing has to do with, with the time period in which this happened. It was kind of this magic grew. So it's 1999. You have the internet there, but it's not the internet as we know it, as you just pointed out. It really is so rudimentary. I mean, it's emails, it's listservs, it's that kind of, but that's a tool that's being harnessed. Sure. But it's a tool that's being harnessed in a much bigger picture. And another, another really important part of the organizing was a warehouse that the organizers uh, rented in downtown Seattle, big warehouse where they could do trainings for how to interact with police officers, uh, how to build big puppets and, and other sort of theatrical elements that were part of the organizing. And it was called this, this warehouse was called the Convergence Center. And when people showed up in Seattle to join the organizing, they could go to the Convergence Center and they could get training, they could get a hot meal, they could figure out a place to sleep while they were there. And I think that real world experience of getting in the same room and organizing together, coupled with, with the online tools that were just emerging, that was a magic brew that allowed them to, to get the messaging out there to people all around the country, all around the world, with farmers from France there. Don't let's not forget. So messaging to people from all around the world, but still getting in the same room, still harnessing local a sense of local community. There were road shows where people went for several weeks before the protests around the country to in union halls and Elks clubs and churches and try to get people to come to Seattle and join. And I think that that hybrid of sort of organizing online and, and organizing in the real world was what made this happen. And I think in today's environment, we might rely too much on, on, on that online organizing aspect where we don't sort of build up the interpersonal trust and familiarity that's really key to sustaining really good and effective protests. DW, with what you just said, I have to ask you, did you ever think of becoming a union organizer or working with a union? Because what you said speaks volumes. I, I you know, I have a, but another lifetime. You know, we, we only have so much life, right? Uh -huh. I, I, I would love to come back and be a union organizer. I think that would be a sweet spot for me. And I think I would be a, a happy, a happy man that way. Yeah. D.W. Gibson, author of the book, One Week to Change the World. It's all about what happened in 1999 in Seattle. The book came out in June. How's it doing so far? What, what do we know about that? It's been great. You know, I've, I've, I've done events across the country and back east and in, in, uh, Baltimore, D.C. area and Seattle and San Francisco and Chicago a few weeks ago. And we'll keep going. And I think as we get into November, the actual 25th anniversary of these events, they'll There'll be more to talk about and more discussions around it. I hope that we keep the conversation going. And I, and I hope that, that there's something that comes out of this in terms of a, what we can see is absolute resurgence of union strength over the last several years in this country and recognizing the role that unions played in this organizing. Again, undoubtedly, the biggest cohorts, tens of thousands of people, they were driving that 50,000 person number in Seattle. They were such a big part of that, all the unions. The steel workers too, right? You know, let's not forget Kaiser was, you know, locked out at this point. So you have so many different unions that were there and a big part of the action. And I, I hope that unions will continue to realize the central part they play in this kind of civic engagement. Yeah, sometimes unions don't even realize the power that they have. And it definitely came through, yeah, 25 years ago. Exactly. Well, thank you so much for your time and your passion on this subject. And let's stay in touch, okay? That sounds good. Thanks for having me. And that'll be it for another edition of America's Workforce. Coming up tomorrow, the power of Melwood and the story of Brad Spencer. Plus, trades futures on helmets to hard hats. Until then, all of you have a safe and wonderful day. 
That concludes another episode of the America's Workforce Radio Podcast. Thanks for listening, and be sure to subscribe so you never miss a show. America's Workforce is a production of Labor Tools and BMA Media Group. Find out more information online at labortools.com. 